All right. Um, I'm starting in Hebrews 6, and I'm talking something in particular. I'm, it kind of will tangent, tangent off into a couple of other issues. Anyway, I got some clear uh, direction and thoughts of counsel in the afternoon, so I'll, I'll try to stick with that, with that. Okay, so Hebrews 6 is, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again, the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Then he goes on, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. And that's not really what I'm going to talk about, but the reason I included it, because I wanted to comment that uh, it kind of struck me as I read it this afternoon. I didn't really correlate this too much in the past, but the uh, admonition or the exhortation to go on to perfection is a serious one. Because look at look at all this. What comes after? Let's go on to let let let's go on to perfection because it's impossible for those who were once enlightened. In other words, if you receive some kind of enlightenment and you don't follow through onto perfection, you see that fail the grace of God. You, you fail the grace of God. This that's how serious going on to perfection is. It puts that gravity on the issue of going on to perfection. Uh well, what I'm, uh, okay, I'll briefly touch on some of this stuff. I'm going after something in particular. Uh, this is the first principles. It's like, it's like I always say, uh, the, uh, it's one thing to know a principle, and it's another thing to know the proper application of the principle at the proper time, properly applied, to uh, result, to come to arrive at the understanding of what the will of the Lord is for any given particular situation so that's what perfection is you know and my classic example was the uh is the uh the drywall job where it was very hot in the house and the boss tells me open up that attic hatch to let some of the air up into the attic and i opened the attic hatch and heat fell down on me and i didn't understand it because the principle uh, that i was thinking was hot air rises so how can hot air fall when hot air rises Pressure, right. There's another principle. The hot air in the attic was under pressure. There's no venting. No release, yeah. So it was under pressure. So the, the principle of, of air coming under pressure was more dominant principle than, than hot air rises. It overtook, it overtook it. It overpowered the other principle. Well, and that's, in a nutshell, in simplicity, that's the way we are a lot of the time in our outlook towards God or what we hope God will do or what he is doing. Well, God, I thought your Bible said such, such and so and so. How come it didn't happen? Well, maybe there's another principle acting on that circumstance you haven't even thought of and uh, it has more uh, preeminence than the principle you're hoping in. And on and on you go. So that's, that's why you know, we have to go on to perfection. Oh, okay. Now, the... the this is listing a whole bunch of principles, which we call Christianity 101, the first principles, the basics. Uh, we're, we're repenting from dead, dead works. Well, we know what dead works are. Dead works are works that we craft in our own mind, our own imagination, the construction of our own religious imagination or our own moral uh, imagination that we think are good. We set the standards. We come up with the work. We perform it, and we derive some sense of pride and contentment that we're good because we did what we said was right and the, and God's not even in it. So it's a dead work. Many works are dead. And many people do good works in the world and I'm sure it may count for something on the day of judgment. It won't save them. But you know how there, there's degrees of hell. There's degrees of heaven. And, you're, and we're being judged by our works. But uh, Dead works are works that serve humanity, let's say, but they don't serve the purpose of God, and they do not fall out, or they do not result in the salvation of the soul. They don't work out a man's salvation. They don't bring him to know the Lord. There are lots of good works that have nothing to do with Christianity, and they're dead. 
They're dead works. Uh, so that's dead works. And of course, uh, we're, we're repenting from that. Paul said, repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we repent and then we have faith. The foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Doctrine of baptisms is, is in a nutshell, without getting comprehensive overly, it, there's different baptisms. There's the baptism of water. On, John's baptism was the baptism of water unto repentance, and it represents the waters of affliction that press you to repent and turn towards God. It's symbolic of that. And then there's the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and then there's the baptisms of affliction, baptism of fire. There's baptisms. Baptism, that's a, there's a whole issue there. That's why in the book of Peter, when it says the like figure where also baptism doth also now save us, it's not talking about a singular act of water baptism. That's not, that doesn't save you. What saves you is the baptism of affliction that con constantly humbles yeah. you and, and, and teaches you no confidence in the flesh, no confidence in man, always pointing and directing you to hope in God, trust in God, hope in his mercy. That's what saves you. Yeah. And the, it's the affliction, the baptism, the constant drowning out of uh, troubles and trials that keep you, maintain your heart in that state of looking towards God. And that's what saves you, that baptism. And the laying on of hands, and that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to zero in on the laying on of hands. So I'm going to give some ex examples. This is by no means exhaustive. And in certain aspects of the laying on of hands, I am not promoting it as an absolute thing. But I want to show a pattern of, of what the Bible talks about by laying on of hands because it's in the list of basic first principles, the laying on of hands. It's very significant that we understand the significance of what it means by the laying on of hands. It means something in the natural and it means something in the spiritual. And I'll, I'll elaborate. All right, laying on of hands, where am I? And resurrection of the dead, of course, <laughs> that's all that we talk about, the resurrection from the dead. If Christ be not risen, your faith is in vain. All your faith and everything you do for God has to be based on your, your bottom line foundation of faith is always the resurrection from the dead. I have faith in God to sustain me through this affliction or through this chastisement or this scourging. And why do I have faith in God? What empowers me to go through all of this. I know that somehow, if God strips me of all my worldly hopes, everything I hoped in, everything I was doing in life, and He leaves me with nothing in this world, I know He'll resurrect me into a lively hope. It'll turn me to the heavenly hope. So whether it's the resurrection of hope in your heart, or whether it's the actual literal hope of God raising your body from the dead, what do you endure anything? What, what motivates you? What convinces you to give up everything in this life? Because I'm going to be raised from the dead. And I, I got something better after the resurrection. Therefore, I can be convinced to give this up. Yeah. Now, you can't see that. It's the evidence. that there, And God says, it, it is evident that I have something for you. But it's the evidence of something you don't see. That's what faith is. The substance of things you hope for. It's kind of a paradox in the carnal mind. You hope for something you don't see, and yet it has a substance. It has a reality. Yeah, it has a reality. God gives you witness of it. And as you go through your walk with God, and you see how the Word of God is true, and how certain aspects of the Word of God come to pass in your life, then when He promises you eternal life and rewards after the resurrection, you say, well... Everything he did for me so far was, the, was true. Then what he must say about the resurrection is true also. Mm -hmm. And it carries a substance. You know, so Jesus says, How can you believe ye that seek honor one from another and you seek not? Oh, that's not actually where, what I'm going for. But that was John chapter 5. And in John chapter 6, the demarcation point, the, the line that Jesus drew to separate religious and unbelievers from the true Christians is, Except you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God, you have no life in you. Well, can we eat your flesh? Is this man going to give us his body to eat? Of course, he's speaking in allegories again. He's spiritualizing. He says, no, uh, uh, does this offend you? Does this offend you that I said, except you eat the flesh and drink the blood, you have no life? And we know what it means. 
except your flesh go through the same experiences as him and except your soul drink the same uh, reaction of sufferings that he suffered, except you be a partaker of his sufferings, in short, in, unless you be partaker of his sufferings, you have no life in you. That's what eating the flesh and drinking the blood represents. He says, does this offend you, suffering with me, losing your life, forsaking all? Does, does that offend you? What and if you see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? If you believe that after the suffering, God will resurrect you, it wouldn't be so bad, would it? But I got a promise. I got a promise so I can let it all go here. I can let it all go. Why? Because I believe in the resurrection. It's all based on believing in the resurrection. All your power to deny yourself or do anything for God and to fulfill and walk in the purpose of God and come on to perfection, whatever hardship it is, whatever price, whatever the cost is, you are strengthened to do it. You're convinced to do it in direct proportion to how much you believe in the resurrection. So if your faith doesn't somehow all, all filter on back to believing in the resurrection, your faith's in vain. If by any means. And if by any means we may attain to the, the resurrection of the dead. Amen. Any means. Oh, that was uh, resurrection. So resurrection is you see how fundamental it is, you see how basic. It's the first thing you press. First thing you, you you hear is that Jesus is coming again. He's coming the second time. There's going to be a resurrection. Amen. Get ready for the resurrection. Once you're resurrected, there's no change going to go on there. Whatever you're resurrected into, you know. Mortal shall put on immortality. Right. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Yeah, he that is filthy, let him be Lord. filthy still. Yeah, the time to get prepared and changed and right. cleaned up and conformed and transformed and all of that. It's all now. Amen. So it, it, it is a vital part of the first principles. There's your first principles. Amen. Now, and it's something laying out of hands. I'm going to focus in on that. That's kind of a general outline of that. Um, so now we're going to go on to the laying on of hands. And I'm just going to feel my way through some scriptures. And I may go back and forth on some things here. All right. Uh, very important issue, laying on of hands. I will look at it. From a physical, and I'll look at it from a spiritual. We know Simon the sorcerer. He bewitched the people with sorceries, giving out that himself was uh, a great one. Great one yeah. And then when he 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 followed the uh, apostles, yeah. caught his interest, beholding the signs and the miracles. Mm -hmm. Wow! Look at these guys. This is quite a show going on here. Boy, well, these guys are getting a lot of attention from their miracles and signs. I'm going to check this out. And when Simon saw that through, laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that whom, who, on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. In other words, it's, it's going to be manifest that he's an idolater seeking attention. Mm -hmm. And he's more than happy to use the power of God to get a, draw attention to himself. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. Pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. Now, to me, sort of hidden in there is the, uh, is the uh, revelation that, that Simon you know, is saved. Yeah. What's the work of God? Believe on him whom God has sent. So Peter said, you know, repent of your wickedness. He indicted him. Simon received the indictment against him and thought, oh, pray to the Lord that none of these things... He believed the indictment against himself. He received it. And he asked for prayer... And, of course, the Bible in Acts doesn't explicitly follow through on Simon, but you, by implication and understanding the principles, I, I would assume he's saved. Okay, 1 Timothy 4, 14-16, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. 
continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So clearly, um, again, a reference to the Holy Ghost being imparted to Timothy by the laying on of hands. Now, just to make a point here, to insert something before I go on, uh, there are exceptions, like at Acts chapter 10, Peter preached to the Gentiles, and that was an exceptional case. And while he, while he yet spake the word of God, the Holy Ghost came on them. Okay? There's no physical laying on of hands. But what I'm saying is there, there is a general pattern where the laying on of hands in the natural is, is observed and, and uh, has a significance here. Uh, and then also it represents something in the spirit, which I'll get to. And all this stuff is like that. Whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's uh, circumcision or tithes, or I have a list here. Okay, whether it's circumcision or ties or uh, baptism or Sabbath or laying on of hands, all these things have a physical and a, and a spiritual. In other words, you know, obviously, circumcise, to, you, circumcise your hearts unto the Lord. And even that kind of spiritual um, allegorical references was, were, were even being portrayed in the Old Testament back in Jeremiah's. You know, rend your hearts and not your garments, and, and that sort of thing. In uh, Deuteronomy 34, verses 5 to, to 9, we know that Moses uh, Moses was uh, the man of God that brought them through the Exodus and everything else, and he was the mediator by whom the uh, law, the handwriting of ordinances came through, and he was also the man who brought down the tables of stone. He went up into Mount Sinai and... and uh, so Moses was the man of God, you know, and even Moses established as a principle that is the same throughout the Old and New Testaments. Moses at one point says, let God, the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may lead them in and lead them out mm-hmm. and so forth. And from that foundational uh, declaration, which I'm not sure, I believe that was before the law, but anyway... Uh, the, the fact is, I think that's in numbers, so maybe after. I, I, I better. Yeah, so the, the fact is, is there's always structure, hierarchy, authority in the flesh, stature, and there's things. As I said before, the, uh, the way God proves us, tries us, and tests us is first according to the flesh, and then we take it into the mm-hmm. spirit. And it works this way with charity. How can you say, I love God, whom I have not seen, if you cannot love your brother, who you have seen? So the first thing is, we are separated from God. We are in a process of being reconciled back to God. We are not fully reconciled. It doth not appear. It's not finished yet. We haven't come on to full perfection. So in the meantime, uh, then... If we are to love God, how do we express and practice and perfect the exercise of charity? We do it among ourselves, among our brothers that we see. We, we begin to try to live in and walk in and express godly charity among those who we see. Because, oh, I can see when my brother is, has need. Uh, I can see these things. Because we're creatures of flesh. So, so you learn how to perfect charity from flesh to flesh. And charity and submission are so closely related, you really, can't, you really can't separate them in reference to perfection. Now, I know I can submit to something because uh, uh, someone holds me at the end of their pointer stick or points a gun at my head and said, do it or else, and so I submit. And we all know that isn't perfect submission, right? It's not perfect submission. The submission God wants is, if you love me, keep my commandments. Because... When something comes, when submission comes as a result of charity, it's not coerced by the authority. It's not imposed upon you against the exercise of your will externally from the authority. It's your love, your respect, your adoration, your fear, your reverence, your recognition of the greatness and the, and the righteousness of the one above you. And, and, and you actually count it worthy and an honor to submit to them that is an expression of worship that can only come from a root of charity. 
So perfect submission always comes from charity. So if it, if if the scripture uh, teaches how to perfect uh, your charity, you must do it among those you see in the church, and then you can love God who you don't see. Would it not be the same for submission? You submit yourself first to authorities that you see. And then you perfect the submission. Now, this is not absolute. It's not, this is not absolute. There are exceptions, you know. Balaam's ass didn't submit to Balaam when he was perverse, and you can go on and on. But we're, we're, we're pinning down a principle. Because here's what I said, leaving the, you know, we're, we're pinning down the principle. Yes, you have to bring the principle to perfection. But you see where I'm going with this? Submission is to those who God sets an authority first, and then, then you could submit to God who you don't see. And that is really the goal, isn't it? The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, unfeigned faith, and, and a, a, a perfect submission. You know, blessed assurance, perfect submission, perfect delight, perfect. There is an um, imperfect submission and there's a perfect submission. Yeah. And the deciding factor there is charity. And that's all there is to that. Simple enough. The gift that was given to thee by prophecy and with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Okay. Uh, now we're, we're into Moses now. Moses and Joshua. So Moses was the man of God. And we have a pattern in the Bible that you know Moses was the uh, figure of Christ, if you will. Just like Elijah was the, uh, was the figure. And you have Moses. And when Moses died, where did the authority go to? Joshua. Joshua. When Elijah died, where did the authority go to? Elisha. Okay. When Jesus, the head of the church, died and go to heaven, where does the authority on earth reside? On the church. And in some men in particular, even. There is a successor. Jesus has a successor. The successor of the authority of Christ is in the flesh, and it's in the church. And it starts with particular men of authority God ministers and he ordains and he sends. You know, this is why you, you, we have to arrive at the revelation, the understanding. We've got to be fully convinced who did God really send. And we know, of course, because uh, um, iniquity abounds, love of many waxes cold. And iniquity, the, the iniquity abounds, and many shall be offended. It's just from the, yeah, offended is from the Greek word scandalized, so scandal. What are they offended over? They're offended over scandal. The misdeeds and the misuse of authority, the, the exposure of, of uh, falsehood and authority, and it hardens their heart from yielding to authority at all. You know, it's like as the pendulum swings, <laughs> you know, you can be too far to the right, you can be too far to the left, you know. You can honor authorities way too much to the point of emulating them, and when they're found out to, to be perverse and God deals with them and, and destroys the structure of what you were in, and then you, you swing way far the other way. Well, I'll never listen to another man again. Mm-hmm. To your own hurt. To your own hurt. No. Amen. No, and then, of course, we know in the ultimate overall purpose of God, God lets us go through things like that to teach our hearts something by virtue of experience. And he's trying our hearts. And the Bible's very plain. Yes, we still uh, uh, submit to authorities in the flesh, in the church, and yet ultimately, somewhere down the line, God is going to prove you. He'll let you hear a prophet speak lies and say, for the Lord your God proves you to see if you love God more than any man. You may come to that test. Scriptural. But I'm talking about a principle. As a principle, we always have to bear in mind there is a submission God is uh, subjecting us to, if you will, in the flesh, which is a stepping stone to being able to submit to God himself. Mm-hmm. Now, you can't, you can't be say a sinner's prayer or come to the church, or you can't repent of your sins, be baptized, get the Holy Ghost, and bang, you have a perfect uh, walk with God, and you don't... Have uh, any? You don't have to be subject to any man. That's ridiculous. That's a, that's not in the counsel of God. No. In fact, the the Bible in First John when it says, uh, "You have no need that any man teach you. You have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things." 
that, that's that's not a, that's not a um, instruction to some individual or some babe in Christ. John is talking to the church. Yeah. He's talking to the church. He says, "You guys don't have any need that any man instruct you. You don't need to get your counsel or your doctrine from the world. You have an unction from the Holy One. If we have a saint in, that has a very deep uh, bondage or vice or." having lots of trouble in the spirit or struggling with a spirit or a demon or anything else. We don't need to call a psychiatrist. We don't need any man, a psychiatrist to teach us what we ought to do. We have the scripture. We have an unction. We have the knowledge of God. We have the keys. We have the power. We have the anointing. We have the backing of God. We have all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things that pertain to. All things. We don't need the world. We don't need their wisdom, their knowledge. That's what he means. The church doesn't. In fact, my, the irony of that statement is, if you think John was talking that an individual doesn't have any need that any other man in the church teaches him, if that's what you think that means, then why is John himself trying to te- instruct them? Then they don't even need John to instruct them. Then John didn't even have to write it, write it then, did he? No, you see... So here's, here's Moses and Joshua, and we're, we're, I'm going to steer everything back to laying on hands. Deuteronomy 34, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the hand of Moab, according to the word of the Lord, and he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab. So here we see the Lord buried Moses mm-hmm. over against Beth Peor, but no man knows of his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force um, abated. He had all the strength of his youth and perfect vision, everything else. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. Okay. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. Mm-hmm. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did it as the Lord commanded Moses. And then we know in other places it says, As the Lord, as I was with Moses, so shall I also be with you. Fear not and be strong. Don't be yeah. discouraged. And, well, all right, so he was standing in Moses' stead. Mm-hmm. And we beseech you in Christ's stead. And Abel was, uh, uh, Abel and Cain. Cain killed Abel, so God raised up Seth. Instead of Abel, in the stead of Abel, they killed Christ, so he raised up a church, a body. A body has to be prepared. Uh, we may get into that now. Acts chapter 13. There was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, it was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Okay, that's a revelation of God's plan for ministering work for Paul and Barnabas. The Holy Ghost said. Now, it doesn't say how the Holy Ghost said. Maybe there was a prophecy. Maybe there was an elder and said, Oh, it's in the Spirit. The Holy Ghost just told me and... You know, it could have been that Urim, you know, just when David said, Lord, shall I go up against the Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go up, I will deliver them into your hand. Well, what is that? Was that a voice out of the cloud? Or was that just a manifestation in the conscience? The Holy Spirit directly manifesting to the conscience of a man, uh, a word, whatever. But it was clear that the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, and then they sent them away. Okay, so in terms of the laying on of hands, uh, uh, just to review, and you know, I always I always go over this once in a while. Uh, the Bible talks about how uh, God is going to make of the two one new man. You have Israel after the flesh, Israel uh, the Israel of God. You have the flesh and you have the spirit. We're to perfect the holiness of the flesh and the spirit, both elements. And uh, in the Mount of Transfiguration, you had Moses and Elijah. The law came by Moses. Moses represents sort of the fleshly administration, the external, the external law, right? And uh, Elijah was the prophet that introduced us to the resurrection of the dead. So he represents the Holy Spirit. John will come in the spirit and power of Elijah. 
It's the spiritual element, the spirit and power of Elijah filled with what? The Holy Ghost from the mother's womb. That's the spirit and power of Elijah is the spirit and power of the Holy Ghost. So Moses is the flesh element. Elijah is the spiritual element. On the Mount of Transfiguration, there appeared Jesus, and on his one side was Moses, and the other Elijah. And then, then afterwards, they saw no man except Jesus only. So we got God taking the elements of the law and the elements of the Spirit and using them both. Using them both. First the law, then the Spirit. First the flesh, then the Spirit. We had to be born first in the flesh, then we become spiritual. And he takes those two elements and he makes Christ, which is the spiritual man operating in the flesh. It's the spirit and the flesh. Perfection in the spirit and in the flesh. He makes out of the two one new man. So there's always those two elements, flesh and spirit. God's using them both. As, uh, and as I often teach in Matthew 23, the Pharisees, uh, if you swear by the altar, it's nothing. But if you swear by the gift, it's guilty. And Jesus says, you fools, what is greater, the altar, the gift, or the altar that sanctifies the gift? And Jesus there is emphasizing the importance of the altar because the Pharisees were poo-pooing away the importance of the altar. Well, what is the altar? The altar is your flesh. What do you put on an altar? A sacrifice. And so what are we, what are we presenting to God as a sacrifice? Our bodies. Present your bodies. There's your altar. Your altar is your body. Your sacrificing is your life. You give your life to the Lord. You see the imagery there? What's greater, the temple or the gold? The gold or the temple, that sanctifies the gold. You know, the gold and the gift, that's the Holy Spirit. The gift is the Holy Spirit. God gives you the gift of the Holy Ghost. You know, the gold is the glory of God. Well, the, I mean, the glory of God is, is wonderful. It's the glory of God. The gift is wonderful. The Holy Ghost is full of glory and power and praise and everything else. The, the Holy Ghost... But, you know, what good is a Holy Ghost to you without a man coming and speaking and preaching the Word of God so you can receive it, so you can comprehend and hear with your ears and, and see with your eyes? And, and that's the whole, the whole essence of God is coming, coming and manifesting Himself as a man. That which, which we have seen, which we have heard, which we, our eyes have seen and our ears have heard and which we have touched and we have handled of the Word of life. Well, that didn't end with Jesus. That's still going on in the church. The manifestation of the image of God through the flesh of the church. And without the church to bring the image into the world, you're sunk. You know, God can have all the glory He wants. It doesn't do you any good until a preacher comes. How beautiful upon a mountain are the feet of Him that bringeth the tidings of good things. How important it is to hear the preaching or to hear, you know, have someone bring you fellowship and the image of God in the flesh and communion with that. That you know, without the altar, without a yielded altar, you have no access. You have no access to God. Man had no access to God until Jesus came in the flesh. He's the only go between. He's the only access you have to God is Jesus. Amen. It's the only access you have to God is your brothers and your sisters and the ministers and the operating of the body of Christ. That's the only access you have. To the extent we yield to the Lord, we have access through one another to the goodness and the glory and all the benefits of God. And without that, we don't have any access. So what's more important to us? The fact that God's glorious? Well, He'll be glorious without us. He'll always be glorious. The goal will always be the goal. The gift will always be the gift. doesn't need us to be glorious, necessarily. What's important to us? The altar. See, He's emphasizing it. Yeah. So you have the altar and the gift, the temple and the gold. You have the Jew after the flesh, and the, like the Israel after the flesh and the Israel of God. Natural and spiritual. And I was already, already talked about making out of two one new man. Here's another thing that kind of echoes the same thing. And you know, I'm pulling these out here and there, and I'm not quoting the scriptures necessarily in their full context, but I'm making a point. Uh, I call heaven and earth to... Witness this day. And one place says against you. Well, heaven and earth. Heaven's the spiritual and earth is the natural. God is dealing with both aspects all the time. Right. All the time. Amen. You can't poo-poo away the importance of flesh. God using the flesh. Perfection in the flesh. Uh, you know, the living holy and righteous in the flesh. You can't, you, can't, you can't discard it. You can't minimize it in any way. Because he's always using the both. Uh, 
Uh, and that's why I say on issues like Sabbath. Well, I keep the Sabbath, you know, I have the rest of God in my heart. I've ceased from my own works like God did from his, and so therefore there remains a rest for me, and I do whatever I want on Saturday. I don't care. Well, if you had to pick between the two, I guess, uh, you know, having the Sabbath established in your heart, I don't know if I should say one's more important. I just said the altar is more important. But either way, no, God wants them both. I'll get into something about that a little afterwards here, or maybe I'm coming up to it in the notes. Uh, and, uh, you know, how the Bible goes on, you know, the Pharisee says that, uh, you, he says to the Pharisee, you cleanse the outward, but inward you're full of extortion and excess and everything else. So we know it's not strictly just an outward appearance. It's not an outward performance. We know we can, we can for a season, by the will of the flesh, by our own power, kind of keep ourselves from doing certain evil things, but inside we still are full of uh, all the potential and it, uh, to sin and full of iniquity. But in dealing with the issue, just remember, Jesus says, cleanse first. This is, this is not that you don't have to cleanse the outward. This is just your order of operations. You cleanse first the inward so that the outward may also be clean. So you still see, there's still an emphasis on an outward holiness <coughs> and cleanness. There used to be a little bit of a debate and a sort of a dis dispute over uh, what comes first. Was it natural or spiritual, or was it spiritual and natural? And, and this all depends on what context you're in. Yeah. Okay, so um, we know that the first man, Adam, was <coughs> natural, first natural. Then Christ came, who is spiritual. You're born into the world. You first come in, you are natural. Then you become spiritual. As we said before, in reference to the fundamentals of, of true theology concerning the eternal purpose of God, going back to Lucifer. Was Lucifer, how did he start? He started spiritual. Where did he end up? Cast out of heaven. If you think, if you want to start spiritual, then, then you're... See, Lucifer, as spiritual, had no reference point, no experience to know the consequence of uh, iniquity, uh, um, rebellion, and resulting in death and separation from God. There's no taste of it. He could not appreciate the consequence because he started in perfection, he started spiritual, and then he had to, therefore, it was inevitable somewhere for his uh, iniquity. It was always there, but just had, it was, you know, thou art perfect in all thy ways, and the day thou was created, until iniquity was, till it was found, till it manifested, till it showed up. And so, to perfect us, we must start as natural first, then become spiritual. Now, once we that so it's first the natural, then the spiritual, and that's on our path to perfection. Okay, and that's a necessity. It has to be that way, because we have to have a sentence of death written on us. For we had the sentence of death in ourselves. How did you get that sentence of death? Because you suffered the consequence of your sin. You know, you perceived or spent some time under the dread dread of God, a fear of going to hell, or God took raked you over the coals, or chastised you, or scourged you dealt with you, reckoned with you, and and your very status before God was challenged. You were uncertain. And you the pains of hell got hold upon you. If you're a Christian somewhere, you're going to go through this. You felt like you're separated from God. You weren't sure. And you struggle through all of that, and somehow God in His grace uh, lets you stay there, but he won't, leave the, you, he won't leave your soul in that hell. And he, if He's gracious to you, He'll bring you back out. You'll find a place of repentance, and you'll realize, I, I should have been dead. I tasted hell. I tasted. I had that sentence of death written in me. Now I know not to trust in myself. Well, Satan had no such benefit in, when he was spiritual. That's what I'm saying. That's why we have to start first as natural. We have to have our encounter, our own personal experience with sin and the taste of death and the sentence of death written on the table of our hearts in a measure. In a measure. Okay, so... Um, yeah, natural and spiritual. So we have to end up spiritual. Finally, we end up spiritual. Yeah. 
But by the time we're spiritual, we know all about death. We know what death is. We've tasted separation from God. He, by the grace of God, tasted death. death. He tasted the horror of being separated from God when he was up on that cross. Amen. It was like he was. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the fact, when, it, when you come to a place where you are already perfected, then it's kind of the opposite order. It's first the spirit, and then it's the response of the flesh. So if I'm walking in perfection, I have a relationship with the Holy Ghost. I'm walking with God. I can hear His voice or whatever. He can somehow speak and, and, and I'll be obedient or whatever, whatever, whatever area. And Jesus put it this way. He said, The Father worketh hitherto, and I work. And that's how it comes down from God. Everything from God comes down. It comes down. So if I'm in the righteousness of God, then God, the Father, or the Holy Ghost through Jesus, the Spirit of the Father through Jesus Christ, gives me a commandment, gives me an understanding, or puts some sort of desire in my heart, which is something He wants fulfilled. I see, I recognize it, that it is the motion of the Father, and I respond. I let it work through my flesh. And thereby the image of God is now revealed, expressed, done on earth as it is in heaven. That starts with heaven, God's spirit. The Father works or he moves. He works, he moves, he has a work. And then he puts it in our hearts and then I work. So that's first spiritual then the natural response, the flesh response. But there's two different ways of looking at that. I know the brothers used to argue this point back around. No, it's first the natural, then the spiritual. No, it's first the spiritual, then the natural. I don't remember what all the context was, but that should kind of hopefully clear it up. Um, that's how I understand it anyway. Now, I'm, when I'm preaching on the... Uh, I've done a lot of preaching over the last couple of years about law and um, the handwriting of ordinances and how that, that's distinct from the Ten Commandments the handwriting of ordinances, and so forth. Uh, in Colossians, he took the handwriting of ordinances that was contrary to us, against us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Therefore, let no man judge you in respect of meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is, is of Christ. Now, people take that to think, oh, we're not under the law, and they have a very simplistic understanding of that. But the, what's, what you have to understand is that um, that was a handwriting of ordinances. Moses wrote those with his hand. He wrote them down. And it was something that God gave to Moses, to statutes and ordinances. I guess in there was the, uh, all the stuff about circumcision, ties, feast days, uh, uh, descriptions of conduct towards one another, whatever, the washing, I don't know, uh, other, other issues. Um, and then that was taken out of the way, which is why... Paul was vehemently opposed to the teaching that you must be circumcised. The circumcision was in the handwriting of ordinances, which got taken away. The Bible in Colossians says Sabbath days, it says Sabbath days, plural. And so the handwriting of ordinances represents things like the feast days, the celebration of feast days, and like I said, circumcision, tithes, other things. Um, now people will argue, I'll, I know I've said this before, I'm giving you a background to lead into something here. Circumcision and tithes predated the law. Before Moses came, there was tithes, there was circumcision. But tithes and circumcision came into the handwriting of ordinances and got nailed to the cross. Okay, When the Colossians talks about Sabbath days, it's not referring to Sabbath day, the Sabbath day. It's referring to the Sabbath days and new moons and... Feast. There's Sabbath days within the feast days. Right. So the feast days would have, a, a, the beginning of a feast would have a, a high Sabbath. And those, those days that are within the feast, celebration of feasts, did not necessarily occur on Saturday. Right. That does not disannul that you keep the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment, this, uh, remember the Sabbath day, and keep it holy. So there needs to be a distinction that's understood between handwriting of ordinances and Sabbath days as it appears. It, uh, applies to feast days and then the Sabbath day which is distinctive not a part of the handwriting of ordinances part of the Ten Commandments which is not a handwriting it was written directly with the finger of God 
-hmm. See, the Bible says law was ordained in the hands of a mediator. A mediator is somebody in the flesh that stands between God and man. That was Moses, his handwriting of ordinances. He, those ordinances were delivered through Moses, the hand of a mediator. What, what mediator was between the finger of God and the table of stone? What mediator was there? Nothing. See, you've got to understand the imagery there, the allegory. God's writing on the fleshly table of your heart. God wrote then on tables of stone with the finger of God. If I by the finger of God cast out devils, if I by the power of the Holy Ghost cast out devils. Writing on the tables of stone was the Holy Ghost straight on the table of stone so it could be an allegory that represents the Holy Ghost writing straight on the table of your heart. They'll all be taught of God. And in that work, God writing on the table of your heart, there is no mediator. That's between you and the Holy Ghost. Now the ministry sets you up for it. It ministers strength to you and it ministers you and convinces you to go through this uh, operation. So there is no uh, the mediator. There is no mediator there. That makes the Ten Commandments distinctive from the handwriting of ordinances. Okay, now I, that's a preamble because I want to say something about certain things here. Um, because uh, you have natural and spiritual, and I went through all of that. Now we ha there, I'm looking at five things here. Uh, when I'm when I'm talking about the law and making that distinction, it doesn't mean that everything in the handwriting of ordinances is now invalid, or the writings of Moses. There are things in the writings of Moses that confirm the, uh, confirm the law of Christ. That confirm. There are certain things written in there that you can make reference to um, if you want to help confirm what the law of Christ is. For instance... Paul says, let your women keep silence in the church. It's not permitted for them to speak and so on. As also saith the law. But if you're going to reference the law to support what you're saying about the law of Christ, basically it has to do with conduct. It doesn't have, it, it, it's not going to include religious ritual and rites that you do like circumcision and tithing. Even though circumcision and tithing are things, those two things are things that have a relevance in the natural and they have a relevance in the spiritual, like all the spiritual principles do. In other words, circumcision. Now, we no longer have to get circumcised, right? Because it was in the handwriting of ordinances. We don't necessarily have to pay tithes, do we? But what, what is the circumcision? The circumcision is the circumcision of your heart. We know that. What is a tithe? Bring your tithe into the storehouse so that there is meat. Well, the spiritual tithe is bring your gift, bring your administration into the body of Christ so there can be meat, the knowledge of God's will. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. That's how you would interpret it spiritually. Does that mean you don't give anymore? No, of course you do. You give. And if you decide, I would like to give 10%, then I don't find any fault with that. But you just don't make it a dogmatic requirement in the churches. Christians have to give 10% because you've started a motion that is beginning a process where people are adhering to external dictates, carnal dictates, and that's always going to distract and pull you away from a personal relationship. No, you give as God prospers you. You give as God moves you. And you give as you purpose in your heart. That's how it goes. Where, where in the, again, where in the New Testament is there any reference to tithes from the apostles? There is none. How about circumcision? Vehemently spoken against. But never against Sabbath. Never. Because Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. That's why. Okay, so I feel like in the past I, I didn't go far enough to, uh, perhaps I didn't may not have gone far enough to say that, yes, the law, the handwriting of ordinances can be a reference point for certain aspects of the law of Christ to support what you're saying about the law of Christ, to support it and add credibility to it, as also saith the law. There are times you can do that. And I believe tattoos are another thing. You know, the Bible says, uh, 
Oh, what is it? Yeah, Deuteronomy. I'm the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make... Okay, I'm, I'm ahead of myself here. Leviticus 19.28. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Okay? Now you might say, well, that's the handwriting of ordinances, or that's nailed to the cross so I can get a tattoo. Well, I don't believe that. Because this... I'm just using tattoo as one example. Now, if you want, we could exact every issue there is and try to, and I'm not here to do that. But this is just something that occurred to me as I was studying today. The tattoos are an issue. This issue of tattoos is something you're doing in your physical body. And the issue of tattoos is something you can directly relate back to the Ten Commandments. And here's how. Right? Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy chapter 5. I am the Lord God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. And Glenn used to teach this. I think Stan, pointed it, Stan points it out that taking the name of the Lord thy God is not like cursing, using his name as a curse word is that you shall not take his name, you shall not identify with Jesus in vain and then live an ungodly life. You have now taken the name, the reputation of Jesus upon yourself in vain because you didn't produce a testimony to go with it. That's really what it means. And then fourth, keep the Sabbath day, sanctify it as the Lord God hath commanded thee. First four commandments are all to do with your conduct and uh, towards God, Right? Don't have any other gods. Don't make any graven images about God. Okay, don't take his name in vain and remember the Sabbath day. And that's, that's all how you, you deal with God as an individual. And the rest of the commandments, by and large, are how you deal with other people. You know, mm-hmm. Don't covet your neighbor's ass or your whatever, and all of that. Thou shalt not kill. And... So the first four commandments are paramount, aren't they? They're, they are... And so, yeah, keep this, remember the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord commanded thee. But now, getting back to tattoos, you do not make any graven image or any likeness of anything in heaven above or that's on earth beneath. Now, we'll dig into the nitty-gritty of God's purpose in the, in the New Testament, how God has revealed it to us. Uh, now, let's put all that together with the scripture in Acts, when Paul's on Mars Hill, and he comes to the statue to the unknown God, and he says, well, to the unknown God, I'll declare him unto you. Now, incidentally, for the, for the Jesus name people who are so concerned about what you say verbally and, and so on, well, here's, uh, I read the account of Mars Hill and I looked at it about two or three times and I realized Paul goes through that whole discourse about the unknown God. He pre- preaches a, a big sermon about that. And in the scripture, not one reference to the name of say, saying the name Jesus. Never says it once. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yet he was in the reputation of Jesus. He was in the authority of Jesus, so on and so forth. That's another thing, that another uh, message. Uh, so, but in that discourse to the people at Mars Hill, Acts seventeen twenty nine and thirty. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead or the power of God. The Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. The power of God, the Godhead, and I'll go further to say the image, the image, the revelation of God's image is not made like unto gold or silver or stone or anything graven by art or man's device. That's why you don't put anything on your body. Because it's an image. And if you're a Christian, there are no Christian tattoos. And so on and so forth. What is your body? It's the altar. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. The body is for the 
Lord. And what is so great about the mystery of godliness anyway? According to Timothy, God is manifested in the flesh. Every time man tries to portray the image of God in any other kind of fashion or device, it's another image. It's another image. The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson does not uh, adequately portray the image of Christ. It's man's device. It focuses on the physical sufferings and has nothing to do with spirituality. Like, like I like to point out that Isaiah says, when God shall see his soul an offering for sin. It was the travail of his soul. It was the agony that he experienced in his soul. He made his soul an offering for sin. The, the physical sufferings, although it was real, there was real pain, I have no doubt. That was not the utter essence of what the sufferings were about. The real thing was, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The horror of separation mm -hmm. and experiencing the reproach and shame and guilt for every sin everybody ever committed throughout all time. Amen. God laying it on him. Like you know how much you, you, you get scared if, if you've sinned and you wonder and you, you feel that kind of like God has departed and, and you're left trembling. And I don't know if you've ever gone through it, but I've gone through it mm -hmm. wondering, did I go too far? And then God will let you go for a while and then he'll, He'll confirm you again. That, that little taste of death, well, Jesus tasted it for all men. He, by the grace of God, tasted death. Well, are we better than him? You don't think you're not going to taste a little death? And we, I covered that earlier. It's a necessary thing. All right, so times of the ignorance, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So what I'm saying is I'm going to talk about the uh, image and relate it back to this tattoo issue, if, if you will. Okay, so any man's, like, painting a picture, you know all the Catholic Church's portrayals of the image of Jesus, some thin-faced guy with a beard and with a pinky hanging out or whatever. Often it's effeminate, and uh, it all falls short. If you produce some other image that is not the image of Christ, but something come out of your own imagination or your own device, that gives somebody something to focus on another image it becomes another image another jesus right. you don't want to be responsible for producing another image another jesus uh, now as we have borne the image of the earthly we all also bear the image of the heavenly so when we talk about bearing the image of god we're talking about the character and the nature and the divine holy living demonstration of holy life that comes through our flesh worship god for the testimony of jesus is the spirit of prophecy your testimony is your life your conversation is your lifestyle you're expressing your life your life is what is expressing you're the living epistles read and known of all men uh, by open manifestation of the truth and I'll add, through your fleshly body, by open manifestation of the truth, you commend yourself to every man's conscience in the sight of God. It has nothing to do with bumper stickers. It has nothing to do with jewelry. It has nothing to do with marks on your body. Nothing, 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 nothing. It has to do with a divine nature expressed through your flesh, and your flesh is totally, entirely, exclusively to be sanctified to express that image. Your body is the Lord's. God does not want the body. This is a fundamental thing. And I don't bow on this. I ca this I count absolute. You don't do anything to your body to express the Lord's image except live his life. And anything you do above and beyond that is outside the framework of God's will. You don't want to put marks on your body. Or carry a cross around. Or carry, or yeah, or wear a cross around your neck. Okay, so we'll go, we'll go there. Oh, why do you wear this cross? Or why do you wear earrings with the cross on it? Or why do you put the sign of the fish tattooed on your arm? Or what? Well, it's because uh, this is how I remember Jesus. It reminds me. Well, Jesus told you what to do in remembrance, right? He's not on the cross anymore. Well, he's not on the cross. That's, Amen. that's another thing. But, you know, he took, the, he took the bread and he took the cup. He said, 
this do in remembrance of me. Right. You want to you want to remember Jesus yeah. in some sort of token in the flesh, in some sort of ritual way, then you have communion. You get together and you take the bread and the wine. This is my body. This is my blood. This do as oft as you uh, as oft as you do drink this cup. This do in remembrance of me. That's the only only thing that you do to remember Jesus. And in the flesh, we do it as a token. We do it as a communion. We actually have you know we actually have a piece of bread and wine, and we have communion. We have a ser- special service or what have you. But in the spiritual. Your flesh and blood, again, it's, it's the life, it's the body and blood of Christ. It's walking in the fellowship of the sufferings. That's what you do in remembrance. That's how you remember it. And anything else becomes an inadequate substitute or becomes the potential to be an inadequate substitute. And so you don't do it. And you don't provide the potential to have an uh, uh, inadequate substitute in remembrance of God for other people either. Uh, something pretty absolute about this. Did Jesus wear tattoos? Who, are, who wore tattoos? Because I heard somebody preach the other day saying, well, if you think smoking cigarettes is, is, a, is a sin, you're full of baloney. Jeez, you're, not, you're under the law and Jesus delivered us from the law. And, see, a bunch of nonsense. Yeah, your body is the temple. That is a valid application. Your body is the temple. It's mm-hmm. well known that... Uh, that uh, cigarette smoking can produce lung cancer and is damaging to your temple. And you're, some, you're doing something deliberately to defile it. God will defile sure. you. And, and, and people think that that is not a valid application of the law of Christ. See, this is this perversion of saying the law has no relevance. That's why I'm trying to put some relevance back into it now. Even though the handwriting of ordinances was nailed to the cross, there's still plenty of things in the law that echo the description of the righteousness of Christ that you can make reference to. Now, don't make reference to the dietary laws or all that kind of stuff. But let's let's take taking pork. There is a good there is a good case for not eating pork. Absolutely. And you don't want to eat pork? Fine. Praise the Lord. I know I certainly don't eat as much as I. As I used to, right. I think it's a good case for it. you. You want, you know, it's well known that uh, to be circumcised, it's easier to practice hygiene in that area. Absolutely. There's a practical value to so because we don't get circumcised to get saved. Does it mean it's a sin to get circumcised? No, go ahead, get circumcised if you want. Don't do it as a requirement of salvation. Don't do it dogmatically like someone that oh, it's my religion. I have to get circumcised. No, you don't have to. But if you do, you haven't sinned. It's like I say, you want to give 10%? Give 10%. Don't hold it as a standard. This is, this is where I got, I got out of the oneness churches. If you're a member of this church, you have to give 10% of your paycheck or you're out of here. Well, I'm out of here then. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise God. Well, <laughs> right? Praise I, the, I, the irony is that they had to just shut up. <laughs> right. I would have given way more than 10%. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Whenever I purpose to do it, yeah. whenever God moves upon me, you know, don't hack the law of liberty into little pieces because <laughs> your church needs money to run. And anyway, okay, so you see, this tattoo issue can be kind of directly related back to the uh, as you look at the first four commandments don't make any graven image, any likeness, any such thing. Don't don't try to portray the image of God in in uh, that kind of thing, uh, because the image of God exclusively is done by your character and your lifestyle that comes through your flesh. Your flesh is reserved to express the image of God in that manner, and anything else I don't advocate. Yeah, no man has seen God at any time. You ain't gonna be able to make an image or something you haven't seen. Yeah, and if you try to, it's gonna fall right. short. Exactly. It'll become another another image. Exactly. Amen. And you say, and even in that covered, of course, if you say, oh, well, I'm just doing this in remembrance. No, well, you do this in remembrance. Amen. Only one thing he said to do to remember him. Amen. All right. So we born the image of the earthly. We're going to bear the image of the heavenly. Now, to re- relate back to the laying on of hands again, I want to make some points there. First uh, Timothy 5.22 says, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Now, I'm, I'm just going to finish off. I'm 
getting close to the end here, uh, to describe the spiritual aspect of laying on of hands. Again, uh, I have not exhausted my study on this. There's few things that I've received in understanding, and uh, I'm not going to speak in terms of absolutes as far as laying on of hands. It's like I say, the first thing I, I noted in my mind was Peter preached, and they got the Holy Ghost, and no physical hands were, were laid on them. But I want, to under, I want us to understand the imagery of this. Like everything else, laying on of hands was a very physical thing. Uh, Moses laid hands on Joshua. Paul laid hands on Timothy. Peter, uh, Simon saw that by the laying on of hands, the Holy Ghost was given. So laying on of hands represents the, a transferring of power, a bestowing of authority and virtue and attribute and character and ability, if you will. John, Joshua was full of wisdom for Moses had laid his hands on them, on him. So through the laying on of hands, the authority got passed down. And there's a certain consistency about that in the scriptures. And then also, when there's a very, very important, deliberate thing that God wanted the man of God to do, like in the book of Acts, certain prophets and teachers, and the Lord said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, or Paul, whatever, Barnabas and... What did they do? This is a very... A shift in direction here. A very specific directive from the Holy Ghost. The change of course here. Well, let's all lay our hands on them. All right? Is any of you sick? Let them call for the elders of the church and they shall... You lay hands. They shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. It's not the physical act of actually putting your hands. It's not to be belittled. You need to actually do that. Ananias laid his hands on Paul. That's right. And he covers his sight. And That's his right. Scales and scales from fell from us. There you go. So you'll see that consistency in there in the scripture. Um, now, the spiritual, if you will, aspect of laying hands on, on people, I'll put it this way. It's, it's when you specifically, you deliberately, with your conscience, consciously, you impose and you involve yourself in a situation. And you use your personal influence and power to alter it. Either you changing the situation, you're altering it to protect or to secure or maintain a situation or to set up something. You deliberately lay your hands. You put your influence. You get involved. You push yourself into the situation. You nose yourself in. Even though nobody asked you to. You just shove yourself in there. You lay your hands on it. Okay? It's a practical example is you have your kids around playing with the toys. And they start bickering and somebody wants a toy and the other one won't share it. And they start arguing. And, and you might just sort of be passive and keep an eye on them. Let's see if these kids can work this out and let's see what happens and they might kind of settle in and figure it out and, you know, like hens get their own pecking order or chickens end up with their own pecking order. They work it all out. But maybe not. Maybe it escalates and the kids start throwing stuff or hitting each other. Okay, so then I will lay my hands on the situation. I'll get up. Hey, you kids! And I'll walk over there. <laughs> I'll say, give me that toy! Give me that toy! And I'll put it back in the toy box and you, go to your room! And you, go downstairs! And uh, whatever I may do. Right? right? To protect the kids. To, to, to limit the, the, the evil. You know, when you, and laying your hands. It, this involves, you're making a judgment. You're judging the kids now. Because there's a plague of uh, a, a plague of discord among the kids, and the plague was not stayed. The plague escalated, mm -hmm. right? And the plague began to spread. Right. Well, what happened in the Old Testament when the plague began to spread? Phineas stood up and he executed judgment, Amen. and the plague was stayed. Amen. So there's your criteria for judgment. You look into the situation. Is it at bay? Is it getting better? Or is it, are they working it out? Right. Or is the plague escalating? Amen. 
Is it spreading? The plague is spreading. Uh oh, we got to put a stop to this. Or someone's getting hurt. So you execute judgment. You lay your hands on the situation. You impose your authority. You don't care what they think. You don't care they get mad or what. I'm going to lay my hands on this. You see, that's the spiritual aspect of laying your hands. Personally involved. Deliberately. That's right. Lay hold on to eternal life. Amen. Okay. And of course, Timothy is the, don't don't lay hands suddenly. Now, I'm not sure what I think of this yet. I'm still, I haven't thought of it in a long time. But uh, we used to have, uh, I've been in churches where people were, oh, I'm not letting you pray for me. Yeah, that's because bad. if you have a demon, it'll come through your hands and I'll get the demon. Well, and I don't know what to think about that. Can you get a demon through the laying on of hands? I think you probably could, but... Okay, well, I'm just putting it out there. It's just something I thought of, and I don't have anything conclusive to say about it, so I'm just sharing it. But anyway, uh, you lay hands suddenly on no man. I'm, I'm not going to put it in that context, but I just threw that out there. Um, yeah, so you don't... Just because just a couple of kids are not getting along so far playing with their toys doesn't necessarily mean that you suddenly go in there and, and mess up their liberty. But, you know, you use criteria, you use wisdom, you use judgment. There's a time to lay your hands on it. Amen. And uh, So don't suddenly just lay your hands and get personally involved in every situation that you think you see some little thing wrong in, Right? Uh, and what's what's at stake here is that um, you don't want to interfere with uh, with God's operation and an individual. You don't want to interfere or undermine the purity of repentance, which is the individual repents towards God. And the more men get involved, the more the chance that they could repent towards men and not towards God. But that doesn't mean that we never lay, that we stop laying our hands on situations. You have to lay your hands on a situation. It's just there's a time for everything. It's it's the wisdom of God. Yeah, if, if you try to lay your hands on every single solitary situation because it doesn't match the judgment of your conscience, then you run the risk of uh, undermining the law of liberty that God's setting up. Now, I always hesitate to say that because the rebels will always say, hey, I'm under law of liberty, you can't tell me what to do. Well, if you're out of order, I can tell you what to do. If the plague is spreading, I can lay my hands on you. Yeah, there you go. And there's lots of scriptural precedent for that. Okay, now the final thing is, who laid, who laid their hands on you? Jesus Christ laid his hands on you. Amen. Paul said, if I may follow after, uh, if I, if I may, how does that go? If I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Christ Jesus. Amen. Which is, you know, kind of a, I was, I was like that scripture because it kind of, summarizes something about how God deals with us. I mean, of course, we have to seek after God, right? And that comes from our own volition. And yet, to, to kickstart the process, God has to choose us and apprehend us. Right. So first thing that happened is Paul was not particularly seeking the Lord. In fact, he was opposing the Lord, persecuting the church, wasting it. Right. He had no ambition to be apostle or saved or anything else. And what happened? The Lord apprehended him. You might say the Lord intervened, imposed himself, laid his hands on him. Okay, that's enough persecution on my house. That's it. You're arrested. He kept escalating and escalating and escalating. That's enough. Yeah. Bang, lay, lay hands on him. Right? Lay hands on him. It is hard for you to kick against the prick, Paul. Okay. And... Uh, he apprehended Paul. I'm going to apprehend you. Then once Amen. he apprehends him, he puts him in the church, makes him an apostle, and says, okay, Amen. apprehend me now. Mm -hmm. Strong you must suffer for my name's sake. Right. Pursue me. Win Amen. Christ. Amen. That's how he does it with all of us. We didn't seek. There's Amen. none that seek after God. Amen. Blessed are the men whom thou choosest. Amen. God chose us. And then the time was right. God laid his hands on us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen, and he apprehended us, Amen. put us in the church and say, okay, Amen. I'm your great reward. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Seek, Praise, seek uh, me. Amen, I apprehended you, now you apprehend me. Amen. So, so you still, there's, you still have to seek God. Right? Amen. We would have never done it unless, he, un, 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 unless he laid his hand on us. Right. Okay, now, 
when you lay your hands on somebody, uh, like Moses to Joshua and so forth, mm -hmm. what happened? The wisdom of Moses came on Joshua. The character, the power, the attributes, the authority of the greater was bestowed upon the next in line. Mm -hmm. you're, you're being set up to receive that image, those attributes. So what happens when Jesus lays his hand on you? What's he laying his hands on you? So that you receive of his power, his anointing, his calling. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you will carry the attributes of the one who laid hands on you. you yeah, if I have a son and I want him to grow up with good moral character and I want him to respect people and everything, then he starts bad, bad talking to teachers or something. And I hear about it, I'll lay my hands. Hey, son, you come here. Now you respect authority, and I'll tune him up and everything. I'll lay my hands on him, and I'll render a judgment. And, uh, well, what am I doing? I'm making sure he grows up with the same kind of character and respect for authority that I, but that was bestowed upon me. And he receives that attribute by me laying hands on him. So when you lay hands on somebody, there, it, it is to transfer it is to receive the same image, eventually. Okay, God laid his hands on us. Did we ask to be saved? I know I didn't. No, he imposes himself. He just shoves himself right in there. Boom, like Paul. And he deliberately brings us under the influence of his spirit. And the goal, of course, is that he'll impart unto us his divine nature. So when some God lays hands on you, it's so that, that all can be transferred down. Amen. And so his nature, his power, is transferred to us through the operation of God, through the process that he laid his hands on us for. And we come under his direct, deliberate, personal influence. And eventually his image is imparted unto us. Amen. And we become like him. Amen. We express his image. And then to... To uh, Well, we become under his influence and we begin to see what he does. We, get, we begin to see how he responds to sin, how he responds. Mm -hmm. We begin to see how mercy works, yeah. grace, Amen. forgiveness, the whole aspect of it, good and evil. We yeah, see absolutely. law and grace. We see it all. And then, of course, and here's, here's the spiritual law that we're describing in John five nineteen. And answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but... What he seeth, the Father do. What things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. God laying his hands on us so that we can become sons. And his imposed influence upon us gives us the opportunity to see what the Father's doing. And eventually we do likewise. So you lay your hands. It's always, it always represents a transferring, coming down of power, divine nature, Authority, righteousness, Amen. it happens through the laying on of hands. It all has to be laid on. God has to lay his hands on you to start the salvation process going. Amen. You yes. have to have the laying on of hands right. for Amen. it to happen in the spiritual sense. Yeah. That's the importance and significance of laying on of hands. It's always a transfer of something. Amen. Very significant. Amen. And... It's like I say, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of ministers who, I don't know, who may have not have had hands laid on them or whatever. I don't, really don't know. I just know in my personal experience, uh, when I was in Canada before Brother Glenn the Evangelist died, and Brother Glenn was the first real sort of man of God that I was under his wing for, for quite some time, maybe 15 years before I even came here. And uh, when I went back there, um, just before he died, he separated me and another brother and said, hey, everybody... You know, Byron, Jonathan, you come up here, and uh, he knew he was on his deathbed. Right. He gave me a bottle of oil, and he anointed us, and he laid his hands and, and declared us loose in our ministry and everything else. Well, mm -hmm. no, I was a minister without that. I, I'll give you that. I, I, you know, my calling is from God. Mm -hmm. But there's something there where there was a kind of a, an official manifested uh, work in the flesh to confirm right. the calling. Right. Which is which really puts a lot of strength in me and my conscience mm -hmm. to see the pattern fulfilled. Mm -hmm. 
a man I considered a man of God, to do that. I did not solicit him to do it. Right. He didn't even plan to do it. It was just a very instinctive, all of a sudden, something came over him, and he, he did that. Right. And then shortly afterwards, um, he died. So, all right, that's it. Laying on of hands is something to think about. Not too much talked about in reference to the first principles that I've heard. But anyway, mm -hmm. praise the Lord. I'm done.